and welcome everybody to this is the last uh, DSG seminar for 2021. And um, I should start by thanking um, SAP, our long term sponsors of the seminar series. Hopefully, we'll actually be able to start doing these in person again um, in the coming year. Um, today's speaker is um, Natasha Crooks. Um, she uh, what can I tell you about her? She got her PhD from Texas uh, a couple of years ago, I think in 2019, Texas by way of um, Cambridge, I think, and joined uh, UC Berkeley uh, after that, where she's uh, assistant professor. She's um, done a lot of work in the areas of consistency and transactions and consensus and um, problems like that. Um, I'm very excited that she's here to talk today because the first time I've had the opportunity to hear her speak. Um, so welcome, Natasha. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And thanks again for the invitation. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about work that appeared at SOSP uh, last um, October. And what this talk is going to be about is how to scale the abstraction of Byzantine fault tolerance through by revisiting it um, through the eyes of database transactions. Basically, in summary, databases did it 30 years ago. Why don't we um, just do it again when applied to BFD? So more generally, and before I go into the specifics of the talk, I just wanted to give um, a little bit of background on what to me is one of the most exciting aspects of data processing systems today. And that's the idea of trust. And so you know, distributed systems today consist of many different parties, whether it's clouds, um, different clouds, different jurisdictions, different organizations, different humans, and they all want to share data and process data jointly. So the question really is, who do I trust with my data? And here, what I really mean by trust is three things. So who can I trust um, to maintain the availability of my data? Who can I, um, so for example, will I be able to obtain my data when I want it? And as we've seen with recent outages in AWS, this isn't always straightforward. Whom can I trust with the confidentiality of my data? So for example, um, I watch way too many baking shows. I don't necessarily want the cloud to know just quite how much time I spend watching um, the Great British Bake Off, for example. And finally, whom can I trust to maintain the integrity of my data? So for example, if I'm, you know, if I'm um, talking to my bank, how do I ensure that my bank will actually execute the transaction that I want? And what I find interesting here is, and you know, something that's becoming more relevant today, is that there's really three types of solutions to establishing and enforcing distributed trust. So the first solution is obviously technical. We've all heard of consensus protocols like Raft. There's many privacy preserving algorithms like Oblivious RAM, private information retrieval or secret sharing. And you know, something um, that is um, very common today is blockchain and we've all heard about it. Now, the second type of solution is an economical solution. And you know, in my mind, there's nothing better than appealing to people's wallets. So what we see here is that there's an increasing merging of economics and protocol design that's really becoming more important. So the whole area of incentives in the blockchain world is one of the best examples of this. Designing a protocol that we know people will follow simply because of money. Another aspect of this, which we see becoming more important is throughput per dollar in the context of cloud storage. So I'm not just trying to design the most efficient, the most high performance solution, but I'm also trying to get the biggest bang for my buck. And finally, you can enforce trust through regulatory compliance. So there's a lot of new privacy laws being um, presented today, whether it's in California, whether it's in um, Europe with the GDPR, which is probably the most well known, but also in Brazil and in India. And those laws are actually placing fairly stringent requirements on um, data systems today. So for example, um, I think Germany and France require data of French and German citizens to be stored in the EU. And recently, I think France passed a law that requires the data centers in which 
the data resides to be operated by uh, French nationals. The other example, which I like to give, it's a little tongue in cheek, but the GDPR has this notion of um, right to be forgotten. Now, how on earth do you implement the right to be forgotten in a data structure like a blockchain, which is by definition append only? So together, I think this merging of protocol design, economic incentives, and regulatory compliance is really going to change how we design data processing systems um, in the future years. And it's something that I'm really excited about. So for today, I'm specifically going to focus on protocols that allow a number of parties that do not trust each other to share data in a way that preserves the integrity of the data and the operations that access and modify that data. So why would you want that, um, you might ask? Well, I'm just going to give you two um, examples that hopefully give you an idea of the types of scenarios that I'm considering and of the types of scenarios that I'm not considering. So the first example is um, a consortium of banks. So traditionally, banks rely on centralized clearing houses that facilitate financial transactions between one another. But that has the downside that you've got this centralized clearing house that you have to trust. So in the spirit of reducing dependency um, on external actors and on improving scalability, a set of banks may want to establish a decentralized payment infrastructure between one another. So in this case, this consortium of bank is defined between, is taking part between a fairly small, maybe you know, tens to hundreds number of banks. The number of the group set of participants is well defined. We know who they are. They all share a common goal, which is to build up this um, payment infrastructure, which looks broadly speaking like a database. But they also have potentially selfish interests and do not fully trust one another. Yet they still need to cooperate and validate transfers and cross bank transactions. So the problem they're trying to solve is how do you actually build and maintain a shared database that will remain correct even if a subset of parties um, collude and or misbehave. So a second example this also in the context of finance is that of central bank currencies, including the digital euro. Here, you want 19 different countries to cooperate and jointly establish trust in a shared currency, namely the euro. And these countries all have disjoint interest. If any of you follow European politics, you know that one of the unifying factor of every country in Europe is that they never agree with each other. So how do you offer European citizens with a simple means of payment that is accepted everywhere and whose value and validity is attested by the EU as a whole, not just a particular country? So here again, you have a well-defined set of participants that form what is basically a consortium, in this case the EU, and that jointly want to provide a service with a subset of these parties potentially misbehaving and potentially colluding. So hopefully you see where I'm getting at here. We're looking at scenarios in which you have a well-defined set of participants from anywhere between you know, five to a few hundreds. They each want to offer a shared service where you can perform data and computation on it. So very much like a database. And these parties want to maintain consistency and availability, even when a subset of participants misbehave. Now this hopefully rings a bell. Whether you like it or not, you've probably all heard about blockchain. And this is exactly the abstraction that permission blockchains want to offer. It's also the abstraction the Byzantine fault tolerant consensus protocols offer. And that's why they are the, uh, the foundation for all the work that has happened in the broad um, decentralized trust slash blockchain um, world today. So BFT consensus protocols is really what I'm going to focus on today. And specifically, at the heart of these protocols, and the reason why they're so popular is that there's a beautiful and simple abstraction that they offer which is that of a totally ordered ledger. And this is a really cool abstraction because it allows mutually distrustful parties to share and replicate data 
in a way that is resilient to some amount of malicious or Byzantine behaviors and still agree on a common view of the system state. So if you totally order transactions and you execute them one at a time, that trivially maintains asset databases, asset guarantees, such as atomicity or isolation. And this makes it easy for applications to materialize a key value store or database on top of the centralized ledger, centralized sequential ledger. So for example, in this example, Alice and Bob are customers of the banking consortium that I was mentioning earlier, and they will take advantage of this um, uh, ledger to execute operations, deposit, withdrawals, transfers, while having the guarantee that when they access the database, they will see the same view. Now, unfortunately, there's probably some obvious limitations with this idea of executing all um, transactions one at a time that are going to come, that, have, that you're probably already thinking about. The main one is scalability. Implementing this abstraction of a centralized ledger in a scalable fashion is very hard. It's both hard to get right from a corrective standpoint, but it's even harder to scale. So consensus protocols traditionally require several round trips of message exchanges, message exchanges. They also normally rely on a dedicated leader to act as a sequencer. So obviously the leader can become a bottleneck. And they usually have expensive recovery protocols. And that notoriously gives BFT a bad reputation for being too complex and difficult to use. So if you look at the little diagram here that I have, this came from a um, ACM article by Jay Mickens about 12 or 13 years ago, where he argued that every single BFT protocol that he has ever seen had a diagram that looked exactly like this. And you know, he's pretty much right. So in addition to complexity, the second obvious problem that hopefully comes across is that consensus protocols execute every operation, every transaction sequentially. And while that's great for maintaining asset compliance, it quickly becomes a pretty significant throughput bottleneck. You have three transactions, A, B, and C. They all have maybe 10 operations inside each of them. They access this stored data, but you still have to execute them in sequence. And so the second issue that comes from executing transactions one at a time, and that is something that is um, also present in traditional state machine replications, so not just BFT, is when you feed them into the log and you let them all exec execute all operations in sequence, that forces you into the use of fairly restrictive transaction models like store procedures or one-shot transactions. And it turns out the database operators don't like these um, um, models uh, very much because they're harder to write. So for example, a recent study that Andy Pavlo performed at CMU showed that the majority of database management database administrators use stored procedures less than 10% of the time. And the reason for why that they gave is that it's kind of hard to separate your application code to write your application code inside of the stored procedure. It's also harder to um, for um, application developers to update the application code because it's split between application and um, stored procedure. In contrast, when you just have an interactive transaction model, you just make the reads and write calls that you need for the database, but the actual um, control flow is in your application, in your preferred language, and this, that, and this they prefer significantly. And this is not something that you can do today with uh, blockchain systems that rely on traditional consensus protocols. So again, the two main problems right now that we see are scalability issues that come from the total order and programming issues that come from the restrictive transaction model. So ordering transactions, totally ordering transactions is, I'm sure you know, very heavily handed. Over, over, it's over um, engineered for real world workloads, which often consist of largely commutative operations. So here are the transactions of Alice and Bob. One is trying to buy ice cream, and the other one is trying to buy an Italian race car. Now these transactions 
could have safely been executed in parallel because they clearly accessed different um, stores, different shops. Unless maybe you have a shop that sells both, but I don't think these have arrived in Berkeley just yet. Right, so these transactions in traditional um, consensus protocols would have had to be executed in sequence. In a database, they would obviously have been executed in parallel. So what I'm saying here is really not a new observation. And I'm guessing talking to a data systems research group that your first thought was sharding. No. If we ever need to add parallelization to a system, we just shard. And then each shard can process requests that access it independently. And that's an approach that's been tried in the past where you split the system into disjoint shards and you have each shard run BFT locally. And for transactions that span multiple shard, you run a two-phase commit protocol to validate the transaction. Right? That's kind of what Spanner did, for example. And a number of BFT systems have done something similar. So what I argue here is that while sharding definitely helps, it's still only really a band-aid to cover the real underlying issue with BFT protocols. So first, you still have a total order within a shard. So if your workload is not fully partitionable, or if you have hot objects, then you're going to suffer from that total order again significantly. Well, second, and like I said, since transactions may now span multiple shards, we need to implement some sort of distributed commit protocol, like 2PC. But what's happening here is we're now coordinating to establish consistency twice, once by replicating within each shard, and ensuring that each replica in the shard is consistent. And then again, by using the 2PC protocol across shards. So for instance, if you're trying to execute two transactions, T1 and T2, that both access shard A and B, you're going to have to coordinate within shard A and order the operations of T1 and T2 there, within shard B and order the operations of T1 and T2 there, and again, you're going to have to order T1 and T2 at the level of the cross shard. So you're doing duplicate work. And finally, and this is really something that I want to emphasize because this is not the case in traditional crash fault systems. It's not possible in a BFT system to shard arbitrarily, or rather it's not free. And the reason for why it's not free is that each shard has to sign its vote in the 2PC protocol. Because the coordinator is now untrusted, it can behave maliciously. Replicas, when they receive the commit notification, need to actually verify the signature of each other shard involved in the 2PC protocol because they can't trust the coordinators out. And the reason why I want to emphasize this is because it actually changes a lot of the design that you could do. So this system that you may know about called Taper doesn't worry about shards being um, sequential because it just has many, many shards. And this is how they achieve parallelism. We cannot do the same in a BFP protocol because each shard is an additional signature that we need to verify. And that's really, really expensive. So what do we do instead? Well, this is where I talk about Bazel. The main idea of Bazel is to take a page from the decades of work on distributed databases. And instead of physically implementing a total order, implement the abstraction of a total order. In other words, we want our system to execute, to generate executions that are not sequential, but serizable. So basically we want to implement executions that instead of implementing a total order, we want to implement executions that are equivalent to a total order. So for instance, we want to allow the following three transactions of Alice, Bob, and Charlie to execute concurrently as long as their execution is equivalent to totally ordering them. In this case, ordering um, T, uh, transaction A first, followed by transaction B, followed by transaction C. And this is, what, again, what distributed databases do today. We're not proposing something new here, but instead we're saying that this is the right abstraction to achieve this um, idea of a scalable um, ledger between mutually distressful parties. 
So with this in mind, we designed Basel, which is a BFT transactional key value store that offers interactive and serizable asset transactions to scale, like I said, this abstraction of a totally ordered fault tolerant law. So what I want to do today is not to focus on the gory details of the protocol, so much as to um, highlight what's interesting, what's challenging in the BFT space. And hopefully, if I do a good job today, to convince you to go ahead and read the papers for those gory details. So what's the second model here that we're considering? Well, we're considering a pretty standard um, BFT uh, setup in which you have a number of replicas, here 5f plus 1, of which f can behave arbitrarily, and the remaining 4f plus 1 are honest and follow the protocol. We're also considering a sharded system, where each shard contains a different or potentially the same sub, um, 5f plus 1 replicas, and a set of clients, which can be either honest or malicious, that access the database and execute transactions. So again, per shard, we have five F plus one replicas of which F can misbehave, and clients run transactions that span either one or multiple shards. And there's a finite number of clients, but an arbitrary number of them can be malicious. So the first challenge that we have to face when we move into this BFT world is answer this question. What on earth does serizability mean in the presence of Byzantine actors, given that we cannot constrain how Byzantine actors will interact uh, within the system? So our first contribution in Basel is to introduce a meaningful notion of correctness for transaction applications in a BFT setting. And what we strive to guarantee is that Basel should maintain an execution that appears to correct clients as indistinguishable from a serizable execution that only contained operations issued by correct clients. So again, what we want, or if we phrase this differently, is that it's completely okay for a Byzantine participant to wreak havoc in the system, as long as honest clients still see an execution that could have been generated by honest clients only. So in our paper, we talk about this definition, not just for serizability, but for all isolation levels. But again, the sort of core intuition here is that if I'm an honest client and I see a set of results, and those results could have been generated by other honest clients, then I will consider the system to be correct. If I see results on the other hand that could not have been generated by honest clients, then this violates the definition of serizability that we propose. Natasha, am I audible? Yes. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. So is the model here that clients are either Byzantine or not all the time? Does so clients are either Byzantine or not all the time, though we don't have a strong definition of identity for clients. We just assume okay. that they're countable to uh, minimize DDoS attacks. So you can always spawn more clients. Okay. By, by malicious here, malicious is, a, is, a, is an interesting definition because you can be malicious and follow the protocol 99.9% .9 of the time. And that 0.1%, you actually try and subvert the system. Okay. So I think once you misbehave, you're always considered as malicious. You're malicious, yeah. But it doesn't actually mean that you're not necessarily following the protocol. Um, yes. And in fact, in a sort of a, a real deployment, you actually want to behave honestly the majority of the time because otherwise you'll just get kicked out. Right. Good. Does anyone have any other questions about this definition? About what I've said so far? Okay. So the second part that we need to, to, to worry about is progress. So Byzantine serizability talks about correctness, but it doesn't actually tell us much about the system doing something useful. So for example, a correct Byzantine serizable system 
could systematically abort all transactions, just always, regardless of what they are. And that would be correct. It wouldn't be very useful though. So we want some notion of progress. And what I want to emphasize here is that this is a little different from the traditional notion of liveness in BFT. We're not talking about the system not responding. We're talking about executing transactions, but never successfully committing them, and instead always aborting. This is still live because you're doing work and you're processing requests. It's just not very useful. So to address this notion, we introduced a, a second, more general BFT system property that we called Byzantine independence. And what Byzantine independence says is that no group consisting of only Byzantine participants should be able to single-handedly decide the outcome of operations. So it should not be possible for a group of Byzantine replicas only to abort, a, to cause a transaction to abort or to cause a transaction to commit. And what's interesting is that achieving this property is actually not easy. And in fact, it's not achievable in any leader-based system. And the reason for why you can't achieve it in a leader-based system is that the leader has undue control over transaction ordering. And so if the leader is malicious, then it can just carefully reorder the transactions that it receives in a way that creates a conflict where they legitimately have to abort. But if the leader had not been Byzantine, those transactions would not have aborted. Hence why this violates Byzantine independence. So what do we do instead in Basel? Well, we center our design around a core principle that we're going to call independent operability. And what independent operability states is that all operations that can be independent, either because they are from different clients or because they access different operations, should be processed independently. And to do this, we adopt a client design, client-driven design, sorry, in which each client drives their own transaction processing and becomes responsible for their own progress. And the main benefit from moving away from the sort of traditional transaction manager design is by having the clients drive the transactions themselves. Clients are responsible for their own destiny. If they want to stall, they only hurt themselves. If they want to be malicious, then we will see how Basil will see in various parts of the protocol that we structure the design such that Byzantine clients can really only harm themselves when misbehaving. Now, the second important aspect of Basil is that we have to strike a careful balance between optimism um, that allows for um, execute transactions concurrently and, and aggressively, so you get high throughput, and remaining robust to Byzantine faults. So the high level, we want clients to execute their own transactions and use an optimistic concurrency control to perform um, well, but we have to be very careful that by giving more power to clients, which is great when they're honest, we're not um, going to create catastrophic failures when they misbehave. So one of the main challenges of Basel is really the balance between optimism and resilience to Byzantine faults. So at a high level, Basel is made up of three core components. A concurrency control mechanism that allows for optimistic parallelism, but ensures Byzantine serizability. A commit protocol that is integrated with the, um, where the, where the replication part and the concurrency control protocol are merged, which avoids redundant coordination and efficiently ensures consistency across, uh, within replicas of a shard and across shards. And lastly, a format protocol that allows clients to retain uh, inter independent operability in the face of Byzantine failures. And like I said, my goal for the next few slides in this talk is to give you an overview of the work rather than to go into a huge amount of technical detail about the protocol. So instead, I really want to emphasize and sketch out the hard parts and the interesting parts. So the first question is, how do you actually execute transactions in Basel? Well, like I said before, 
clients use an interactive transaction model and speculatively execute their own transactions in parallel with other clients, just as you do in a standard OCC um, style protocol. So the con concurrency control protocol that we implemented is a replicated version and a BFT tolerant adaptation of multi-version timestamp ordering or MVTSO. So MVTSO is a pretty well-known protocol that works roughly as follows. You assign all transactions a timestamp, which defines an a priori order on these transactions. And then you execute these transactions. And if for whatever reason, they don't follow the order in which they were assigned, you abort and retry. The nice thing about MVTSO is that it exposes the rights of ongoing but uncommitted transactions early and allows concurrent reads to form dependencies on these uncommitted rights and commit when their dependency does. So it tends to create smaller conflict windows, which uh, reduces the impact of contention and in turn um, creates um, higher throughput. The flip side of MVTSO is that because it exposes uncommitted rights, you can end up with cascading aborts. So why did we choose these, um, this concurrency control specifically? Well, it has two desirable properties that we want for base. First, by exposing not just committed rights, like in an OCC protocol, but also uncommitted ones, like I said, it minimizes the time for non-serizable interleaving, which increases the likelihood that concurrent transactions will commit. And that's especially important in a BFT system where there might be, where the commit protocol might be more complex and might have more phases than a standard um, a crash fault, a replicated system. The challenge of this asks to the system is that there can now be uncompleted transactions, which could prevent subsequent clients from committing as they would block uh, for these transactions to finish. So Byzantine client could just start a transaction, right, and just never complete it, which would block honest clients from finishing, which violates um, Byzantine independence. So what I find really interesting here, and I think it's a subtle point, but Allowing transactions to block on unfinished transactions, as opposed to simply aborting them as you would in standard OCC when they become visible, is actually turning aborts into blocking, right? So in cases where you would normally have aborted, you're now actually going to block. Now this is potentially dangerous um, if abused by a Byzantine client, but what we do in Basel is that we're very careful about what information actually gets sent. And what I'm gonna show you in the end of the talk is that we structure the system such that if a Byzantine client becomes block on a transaction that isn't going to make progress, the, the honest client can always finish the transaction that is blocked itself. And as such, never gets permanently stuck. And if you combine this particular aspect of the protocol where you can finish other clients' transaction if they're stalled, combined with the fact that we um, transform aborts into stalling, really minimizes the influence that a Byzantine client can have on the system. That's, I think, a pretty cool part of the protocol. There's a subtle point that you don't necessarily see at first glance. So in more detail, how does MVTSO work? Well, the first step is MVTSO is to assign a timestamp. Unfortunately, we're off to a pretty bad start as Byzantine clients can lie about their timestamp and generate arbitrarily large timestamps to cause conflicting transactions with smaller timestamps, with smaller timestamps to abort as they violate the serialization order. So what we do instead in Basel is still to let each client optimistically choose its own timestamp but rely on some weak clock synchrony assumption to reject timestamps that skew too far. And the reason for why this is still a sensible choice and for why Byzantine clients can't abuse this is that Byzantine clients have to be very careful about what timestamps they choose. If they choose one that is too large, then the transaction will just get aborted and they can't hurt the system. So the most rational strategy for Byzantine clients is actually to choose 
a timestamp that is truthful. So the next step that you do is to, once you've chosen a timestamp, is to execute reads. So like in OCC, you read from the local replica, or you read from a local set of replicas. In NVTSO, for serializability, you always need to read the latest version stored at a replica. Now in the BFT context, if you were to read from a single replica, you could be tricked into reading a value that is arbitrarily stale which would again violate Byzantine independence because it would cause a transaction to abort when it wouldn't have otherwise. So to address this issue, correct clients in Basel make sure to read from at least one correct replica so that they are always guaranteed to see um, a valid response. So remember you have F malicious uh, replicas. So in Basel, you read from F plus one total replicas, and you sort versions that you receive. So you might receive uh, versions one, two, three, and four, five. And then you select the one with the highest version number. So because you're selecting the one from the highest version number, you know that the F smaller ones, even though they were all malicious, couldn't have forced you to read from a lower version. So this process, selecting the highest one of F plus one total, forces um, ensures that the client will never read an earlier version than what a um, honest replica would have proposed. The next step is to execute writes. So here we modify MVTSO. Normally, MVTSO makes writes immediately visible. Now, this is great for throughput, like I said, as it minimizes conflict windows. But unfortunately, it does not align well with Byzantine independence. A Byzantine client could start a transaction, write an object, but never commit the transaction, which would cause an honest client to potentially block forever or to abort. Instead, what we do is to delay exposing rights to when a transaction prepares, so starts the two-phase commit protocol. And the reason for why we delay it until that point is twofold. One, it's still earlier than at the very end after you've run the 2PC phase. So you're still minimizing the conflict point, which is still what you want. But the main benefit of exposing rights when, once you've prepared the transaction is that this prepare message actually contains all the information about the reset and the right set of the transaction that you need to potentially re-execute the transaction. So by making writes visible only when a transaction is prepared, it actually allows clients that are blocked on this transaction to finish the transactions themselves by rerunning the prepare phase, because all the information is, is included in this prepare request. This is really where the client driven of Basel is, I think, super cool. Instead of stalling, an honest client can just take the prepare message and then run the 2PC protocol itself for that transaction. And we'll see in, in the last part of the talk that this client cannot affect, cannot change the decision that would have happened if the client had actually finished its own prepare. Right? So you can't have malicious clients finishing the transactions of honest clients and causing them to abort. So the last step is shared with any optimistic concurrency control protocol, and that's the validation step. And so the validation step here is just to ensure that um, the versions that you read and what you wrote do indeed yield a serializable shed. And this determines the vote of the replicas when the client begins the commit phase of the protocol, just like in any 2PC um, scenario. So do we have any questions here? I'm happy to clarify any uh, misunderstanding or, or, or confusion. I just wanna make sure that the reads and writes can go to any shard, right? Yes. These don't have to be single shard transactions. 
No, these are just general interactive transactions. General, okay. Sorry, I had a quick question. Um, do do we need to like worry about some something similar to cascading a board, or they can't happen? Um, cascading and boards are um, definitely a, a, an issue here, um, just like they are in, in traditional VTSO. Um, what we disallow the system to do by this property of business independence and by the um, commit protocol that I'm going to describe next is for uh, Byzantine clients to intentionally abort their transaction and trigger additional cases of cascading aborts. Ah, I see. Okay. Okay. So this, uh, would you would you consider that part to be like pessimistic in the sense of avoiding cascading aborts? Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I... So we, 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 we do allow for cascading aborts um, right. if an honest execution would have led to cascading aborts. I see. Okay. Um, in practice, we, we bound the length of the dependencies, um, just as you do in a sort of traditional MBTSO system to minimize the impact of a cascading abort. Mm -hmm. So I think we, in, in the experiment, we bound the length of dependencies to 10, and we found that was the sweet spot. Otherwise, we'd start seeing very um, unpredictable behavior um, because you could have very, very long chains that get created. Right. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the last part is actually committing this transaction and running the two-phase commit protocol. And you know, two-phase commit is at the backbone of pretty much every uh, distributed database, which is why I'm spending some time on it here. And in Bazel, there's a number of additional challenges that one has to address. So the first one has nothing to do with BFT, but has to do with the fact that we actually merge replication with concurrency control. And what this means is that replicas can legitimately receive a different subset of transactions, which can um, cause them to give different responses when they locally execute the uh, serializability check. So for instance, replica one might receive T prime and prepare T prime, which conflicts with T. So tell T the, so tell Bob that T must abort. Whereas replica two did not know about T prime. And so we'll tell Bob to commit. Right, so this has nothing to do with BFT. This is to do with the fact that each replica can locally receive a different order of, um, can, can locally receive transactions in a, a different order. The second challenge actually comes from the BFT nature of the system. Specifically, replicas can lie. Byzantine replicas can lie. They can come, they can vote to commit a transaction when they should have aborted, which values serializability or they can systematically vote to abort a transaction when it should have committed, which uh, violates Byzantine independence. And the client can do the same. So at a very high low overview, the 2PC uh, protocol in Basel looks like this. You have a prefer phase and a write back phase. And it's driven by the client. So the client is the one that collates the votes of the prepare phase, aggregates them, and makes a decision which it communicates in the right back phase. So I'm going to focus on the prepare phase in this talk. And the right phase, back phase is pretty standard. It simply consists of aggregating the shard votes. So in the prepare phase, you have to aggregate within each shard um, the votes of replicas, combine them to create a shard vote, and then combine each shard vote to make a decision. So in this example, all replicas within shard one voted to commit transaction T, but so we the shard vote for um, shard one is, is, is a yes. Um, in contrast for shard two, uh, three of the four replicas voted to abort a transaction. So in this case, the shard vote might be abort, which means that overall the transaction should, should abort. Right, so it's a pretty standard, a 2PC protocol. The challenge is how do you actually um, collate those shard votes in a way that preserves the properties that we want, Byzantine serializability, Byzantine independence, 
and how do we ensure that um, if a client is malicious, we still get back the um, intended decision. So to maintain Byzantine serizability, we're going to, in the presence of the BF sort of challenges associated with BFT and um, out of order processing of operations, we're going to supplement the local concurrency control check to verify serializability with a quorum protocol, where we're going to have to do some form of quorum validation. So like I said, each client collects the replica votes from every replica within a shard. And if sufficiently many deem that a transaction is locally serizable, then the client concludes that it is safe to commit um, that particular transaction on that shard. So in the example on the slide, we have six replicas who all vote to commit. So here's easy, um, every replica agrees. So the vote for the shard itself is definitely commit. Now, this might not always be the case. And in some cases, concurrent transactions may conflict, which causes clients to receive fewer commit votes or be forced to abort. So in this case, if the client receives um, different responses from different replicas, we actually need an additional round trip to make the shard vote decision durable. And what do I mean by durable? Well, I mean that if a subsequent client that is trying to finish a transaction, th that same transaction, we need to guarantee that that client will always see, will always come to the same decision, even if it sees a potentially different set of votes. So this is very similar to why most BFT protocols um, need a second phase. Right, so again, in a traditional BFT system, you can only expect, if you have five F plus one um, replicas, you can only accept uh, expect responses for, from N minus F of them because F might have failed. But the ones that you uh, receive might actually contain malicious replicas. And the F remaining ones were actually just slow. So basically, two clients can only be guaranteed to see N minus two F of the same responses. So this extra phase is necessary to ensure that independently of which N minus two F responses they see in common, they will always come to the same conclusion. So do transactions have identity? Yes, they have an ID that is defined by the, um, which is a hash over their right set. Okay. Client ID combined with a hash over their right set. Okay, and this is how you, this is what you use to talk about the same transaction being executed multiple times. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Great. So one of the um, interesting um, points I want to highlight, and I won't go into detail here, is we only need to do the second phase on a single shard, no matter how many shards are involved in the execution. So we need to log the final decision of the transaction onto a single shard. And I won't go into the details here, but this is something the traditional um, protocols based on state machine replication can't actually do. They have to incur this second phase for all shards. So this is one thing I'll um, encourage you to look at the paper for. But the one thing that I want to emphasize is that Bezos commit protocol is designed in a way that allows neither clients nor groups of Byzantine replicas to single-handedly design results, to dictate results. And the reason that we can achieve this is through the quorum validation that we use and the specific thresholds that we maintain for determining when it is safe to commit a transaction and instead when we should abort. So specifically, we guarantee that when we say that a transaction commits, there are always on sufficiently many honest replicas that are um, vouching for the fact that no other conflicting transaction exists, right? And so this is necessary to maintain Byzantine serizability. Conversely, when we decide that we should abort a transaction, we only abort if there is at least one correct replica, if we are guaranteed that at least one correct replica voted to abort. And this is how we guarantee Byzantine independence. And for the specific thresholds and the subtleties there, I'd encourage you to, uh, to look at the paper. 
So what I swept under the rug in the previous slides, but have teased that already, is that you know empowering clients also empowers Byzantine clients to cause mayhem. And specifically, they can intentionally generate transactions that conflict with honest transactions, let them read their values but fail to commit, which causes honest transactions to, to block or abort. So I've, I've said this you know, in various forms already, but the way that we address this in Basel is by allowing any clients to drive the commit protocol for any transaction. And this is perfectly safe, since one, I told you that only the rights of prepared transactions are visible, so we can always finish a transaction. And B, because of the commit protocol, the client is not able to unilaterally decide the outcome of a transaction. Instead, it always has to rely on the replica vote. And like I said, the replica votes are guaranteed to yield an execution that is Byzantine independent and Byzantine serizable. So this protocol is what we refer to in the paper as the fallback protocol. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go to the details of this recovery protocol, but I do want to emphasize that it has some nice properties. So in the common case, it only relies on a single additional round trip. It only involves one shard, independently of the number of shards that a transaction accessed, and it has linear communication cost. So like most BFT protocols, the details do get um, fairly involved. But one point I want to emphasize is that because clients are in charge of their own destiny, recovery actually only affects contending transactions. So in other words, if a transaction T is blocked on object O, only transactions that access O will be delayed and need to recover. And this is very different from existing BFT recovery protocols, where if you need to replace a failed leader, you have to block the processing on the entire shard. Now, there's a number of additional challenges that we need to address here in the, in the recovery protocol, which includes if the client's equivocated, multiple clients live locking by trying to um, finish the same transaction. And this is one of the many pleasures that you'll have if I manage to convince you to go ahead and read our paper. So in summary, this is all that I'm gonna say about Basil before we look at numbers. So I just want to remind you of the system's main properties. Basel is a replicated and sharded BFT database that implements interactive transactions to offer a flexible interface for developers. It is both Byzantine serizable and Byzantine independent. And on the performance side of things, um, Basel allows transactions to execute in parallel rather than sequentially. It allows them to commit across shards in just a single round trip in the common case, has linear communication, and does not have some of the drawbacks associated with being leaderless. And in a very brief um, next minute, let's just look at numbers quick. So we implemented TPC um, three sort of types of workloads that are standard in OLTP, TPCC, small bank, and retwist, which all use um, interactive transactions and experience various levels of contention. And we compared against three baselines. Taper, which is a crash fault tolerant database that like Basel merges concurrency control and replication. On the BFT side, we um, implemented two baselines which follow a standard modular approach that the layer TPC and concurrency control on top of a black box BFT consensus protocol. And we chose hot stuff and BFT smart, which are two state of the art um, BFT consensus protocols. So if you look at throughput for the three applications and here higher is better, we find that Basel comes within four X of taper to the crash fault tolerance system. And here's Basil's main sources of overhead are the need for signatures and larger quorum size. In contrast, Basil has significantly higher throughput than both hot stuff and BFT smart between 5X and 3X respectively for TPCC. And the reason for why Basil um, achieves higher throughput is because it maintains lower latency. Merging the concurrency control with the replication allows Basil to commit in a single round trip over 96% of the time. And there's many micro benchmarks in the paper, but this gives you a sense of the numbers. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through graphs um, that talk about failures. The main point that I want to emphasize here is that Basil's performance remains high under failures. In the worst case, it actually performs, it sees a 25% throughput drop for 30% of clients failing every other transaction. So you have 30% of clients that 
um, stall every other transaction, um, the performance degrades only by 25%. So with that, let me just skip to a, a shameless plug. Um, this is the students I have the privilege to, um, to work with. Um, the three students on top are looking at transaction uh, protocols in general. Um, Matt uses um, speculation to improve transactional throughput. Audrey is looking at transactional caching. And David is trying to put us all out of business by automatically synthesizing scalable consensus protocols. And the bottom three students are all working on BFT transaction processing. So Florian was the lead author of this work. Samu is looking at adding query processing on top of um, Basil. And Neil is looking at new uh, types of aggregate signature, cryptographic aggregate signature schemes to improve the performance of um, existing um, consensus protocols. So with that, I, I'll conclude. Basil is a, a system that scalably builds up the abstraction of a BFT, a totally ordered log, in a highly concurrent and highly resilient way by leveraging asset transactions. So thanks a lot. Um, and you know, happy to take any questions. And if you have more technical questions afterwards, I would love to talk to you. And if you can shoot me an email, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Natasha. Uh, I definitely have a couple of questions, but I wonder whether anybody else does. If you have questions, just like come on camera if you're willing and turn your mic on and Okay, well, let me get started with one and maybe other people will have some too. So I'm trying to understand this idea of um, sort of the abstraction of a fault tolerant log. So in Basil, like, is there a ledger materialized anywhere or no? No, we directly, um, we, so we keep track of, of the partial order of transactions. Okay. Um, but we store the state as a traditional database. Okay, um, so like like in, in a normal, uh, so one of these, um, BFT systems like the like a hot stuff. Like I'm I have a I mean there's this um there's the ledger and I have my local materialized view yes. of the states that I can apply the ledger to. And when I want to run a transaction, I'm kind of running it against that like my materialized view and then trying to commit it, right? And add it to the ledger. But in your in Basil, the the servers in the system are actually maintaining the view like the database the, the keys and the values yes yeah and they could materialize the ledger if they wanted to by okay. um looking at their local partial order okay so could they materialize the ledger i mean there could be multiple ledgers that are like with non-conflicting transactions in different orders right there could be multiple total orders of the things that happen in that system that um, yes. would be consistent with the state. They would, they, would they would be able to materialize a single partial order. And obviously okay. um, with that partial order, they would potentially all see different um, linearization of that partial order. Okay. Okay. So for, for some kind of application that actually, for which the ledger is actually important as opposed to serializably executing changes to a database, the, the Bazel is not the right thing to use. So as would Uncle you... to us, what type of applications would benefit from having non-conflicting transactions um, ordered? Okay, and so as- uh, But I, I agree with you that if you need, um, like for example, a submission order, you need to order by timestamp, which, um, and it doesn't really matter what keys you're accessing, but you actually need um, transactions to be reflected in the ledger in order of say submission order, for example. Right. then we wouldn't be able to guarantee this. Okay, and as long as I don't care about the order of um, sort of non-conflicting transactions, you can generate, you can kind of go in the other direction and generate, you, you have enough information to generate yeah. that ledger if you need it. This is something that is becoming a little bit more common. So you have a protocol called AVA um, in, in a sort of popular blockchain protocol that is actually starting to um, structure transactions as a DAG as opposed to a chain. Okay. So I think increasingly you're seeing more um, like commercial available, like blockchain style protocols structured as DAGs, um, precisely because that's the only way you're going to get scalability. Okay. 
And uh, if no one else is going to jump in, I want to. I just want to ask one other thing. So, do other um, sort of BFT protocols worry about the correctness, the Byzantineness of clients? Like, you have a client-driven protocol here, right? And you have a constraint on sort of how many servers can be Byzantine, and then you also allow clients to misbehave, right? So is that there's something... a few protocols that rely on it that, that, that also deal with this. Um, um, Ziziva is one, um, and Ziziva is a protocol that appeared, I think, in about 15 years ago now, right. that um, also relied on clients to have a single round trip fast path. Okay. Um, and there it had to it had to worry about the the the, the behavior of clients. Okay. Um, there's a couple of other protocols that also remove um, protocols that remove the a leader. And thus sort of place more responsibility on clients tend to have to, to worry about Byzantine clients. Right. Those who rely on leaders don't because um, there's a client, like all a client can do is submit an operation. Like, submit an operation and you don't really care what they submit. So it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's see if I see Ida's on camera. So let's see if there's other questions. Yes, thank you. Hi, Natasha. Thanks for the interesting talk. I have a question uh, about evaluations. Uh, so uh, I was wondering uh, if do you care about uh, uh, checking the throughput with respect to the committed transactions, uh, or does it make sense, uh, or you only care about uh, checking? Uh, for all of the transactions. So we, we only need a throughput for committed transactions um, because that's okay. what we consider to be you know, the good put, what, what the clients um, care about. Um, and specifically in the, in, the, in the failure scenarios, we also looked at throughput for honest clients only, not for Byzantine clients, because that's also what you care about. So we looked at how the committed, the number of committed transactions for honest clients was affected um, as malicious clients misbehaved. I see, thank you. Mariano? So good. Yeah. Hi, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. So I have a question that is a bit coming back to your comment of um, you cannot order uh, the transactions by timestamp. And uh, I, I really would like to understand um, how the timestamps are chosen by the clients. Uh, this, in some settings, maybe uh, it's not desirable. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more about the concerns about um, you know extracting values uh, in blockchain. Some of the proposed solutions are like having uh, uh, oracles that sequence transactions, which is effectively a centralization. It's not a solution. So I, I'm trying to to understand if you were using the system in a setting were trying to have some sort of fair sequencing where basically no client can inject transactions to try and extract value in between transactions that they are seeing other client post, right? Um, how, how would that work? Is, is, is it something that you, you could contemplate addressing in, in the system? So if I understand um, what you're saying correctly, the way that we prevent this scenario from happening where um, a client sees that another client is you know, operating, um, is executing transaction X, and therefore is going to try and submit a transaction X prime um, to sort of front run transaction X. Correct, yes. Is um, by um, this sort of property of Byzantine independence. So we cannot prevent a client from seeing the network of transaction X and before that transaction has hit any replica submitting transaction X prime on a faster link. That's nothing that we can do here. What we can do, however- now, could, I, could I ask you to clarify that? It's to how many would this be, you can win if you manage to submit to F plus one faster than somebody else, correct? Or is, there, or is it simpler than that? You can win if you manage to, to submit to uh, F plus one faster than, as long as you as, as long as you can submit your transaction to an honest replica faster than I can submit my transaction to an honest replica, um, then there's nothing that we can do about it. 
what we can do and what we try to prevent is a malicious replica seeing my transaction, receiving it, not executing it, asking you, hey, can you please submit a conflicting transaction so I can legitimately abort it, executing yours first, and then uh, telling me, sorry, Natasha, your transaction has aborted. And the reason that we prevent this is by requiring at least F plus one abort votes so that there's at least one honest replica that should have seen your transaction first before mine. Right. This this is a um, this is a problem with the assumption is that uh, the the replicas could have clients as well, behave honestly, but then have clients that are basically front running everyone. Correct. Exactly. Yes. That, that's correct. Thanks. I mean, just this is something that you you I mean, do you see it as something that could be addressed, or is something that really has to be left of this setting? I don't currently see a scenario in which if you can see if you, if you can have control over the network and you can reorder transaction as they arrive in the network, I don't fully I can't currently see a scenario in which you can prevent this. Without c control of the network, I think as long as you trust enough honest replicas to um, execute the transactions in the order in which they were submitted as opposed to in the order in which Byzantine replicas or Byzantine clients would like them submitted, then you can mitigate the impact of front running. Thank There's you. a number of existing other work that is looking at fairness. I think Byzantine oligarchy yeah, is a yeah. paper, and Ari Jules has but, another but, paper which also talk about similar issues. Who, who sorry, who do you, who do you, who have you mentioned um, now? There's a paper by Lorenzo RVC on, um, that appeared at OSDI last year on Byzantine OSDI, oligarchy. Yeah. And there's a paper by uh, Ari Jules on fairness in transaction ordering. I think we deal with similar yes. issues. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a, I had a question about, um, so when, when you did scalability um, studies, since you have several components, like you have quorum protocols, you have the uh, you know optimistic and currency control and so on. Do you know what limited scalability? Uh, signature costs. So, um, so in the um, larger the number of shards that we have, the more signatures you have to verify. Um, because as a client, as you know, if you don't trust me, the client, then you have to verify the votes of shards themselves. And even if we use threshold signatures to collect votes within replicas, you still need to verify if I access N uh, transactions, N shards, you still need to verify N votes. Uh, so that was the biggest limitation factor for us. I see. Yeah, thanks. One of the interesting things is the batching in a, in a transactional setting works a lot less well than if you just have a traditional BFT protocol or consensus protocol, because the more you batch, the larger latency you increase, the more you la increase latency, and therefore the more you hurt throughput. And so traditional BFT protocols can ignore signature costs by having batches that are, you know, 200, 300, 400 operations along, which is what, how hot stuff is evaluated, for example. But as soon as you try and build a real application on top, like a, like a database, then suddenly your batches can have to be have to be a lot smaller because otherwise your transaction is just always a board. All right. Okay, great, thanks. All right. Anybody else? Uh, may, may I ask a oh. question, please? Oh, good, yep. Um, hi, Natasha, thank you for your very interesting talk. So about these batches, um, in the batch, the, can, can the transactions be executed independently? Yeah, so we, we don't actually do any batching because we no longer have a leader. Instead, what we do is reply batching, where we actually reply, we actually um, aggregate the replies um, for different clients into a single reply batch sign it, sign the root of the Merkle tree um, and 
send the Merkle tree plus, you know, log B messages um, so that we can reply, uh, we can um, batch signatures for replies, not for um, uh, transactions. I was asking because I was a little taken back by the observation that, that batching was hurting throughput unless unless the entire batch has to be committed atomically, it, it seems like you could find some maybe simple workarounds. Just you receive a batch, but you execute the transactions as if they were independent requests anyway. I think the main challenge here is that the um, the if you want interactive transactions then you um, you um, have to wait. So you, you send your reads um, as you would normally in, in a system. So you're not going through the SMR protocol, but then the SMR protocol has to execute the prepare phase. And so you get the notification that the prepare phase and the commit phase has um, executed later than you would otherwise, which is where you increase latency. So you're still executing the transaction in parallel. But the commit phase you have to execute sequentially, and that's what drives latency up. Okay. And if I may, um, so I believe that you, you mentioned the bottleneck was the signature uh, verification, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So a similar type of comment. Uh, if if we can verify a collection of signatures independently, then it, it would seem that with multi-core parallelism by throwing more cores at the problem, we could relieve that bottleneck. Is that is that how it works? Yes. So by adding more cores, you could definitely um, make signature the, um, mm -hmm. remove the signature bottleneck, at which point, um, depending on the values of F that you have, um, because we have five F plus one replicas, the um, bottleneck will um, eventually be the network. Right. And do you have some sense of, of at what point the bottleneck shifts away from the CPU and toward the network as, as we increase the number of cores? Is it in the cores numbering in the tens or hundreds or? It depends on the value of F that you have in the number of shards. Okay. Um, we found it to be pretty high because we were running on, on, on you know, the, the values that we were that were pretty small. Okay, I'm sorry. So you you tested with small values with of f, and then we, we tested on on, on so we tested both on on small data sizes. Sort of each mm -hmm. key, each payload was relatively small. TPCC has relatively small payloads, um, and the values of f's were were relatively small as well. And we had a fairly I think we had um struggling to remember now, but the network that we run was a fairly fast network, so we were nowhere near close to saturating the network. I think we were max one gig through um one gig throughput. Sorry, one gig. Utilization. Um, and there we were, we were already um, CPU bottleneck with values of F of equals one. Did you have like off the shelf uh, processors with let's say 24 cores or something? I can like that? look it up. Um, I have the paper pulled up here. Uh, we had off the shelf processors with, I think, uh, let me see, um, 10 gig NICs, um, eight core CPUs, and 64 gigabytes of RAM. Eight core. Okay, so that's not not a lot, but no, but definitely not a lot. We certainly could have um, um, made signatures no longer the bottleneck if we had dedicated the number of cores to it. I think the results with taper would have also changed mm -hmm. because you know taper doesn't like can use these cores for parallelism for right. useful work, and we have to use them for crypto. Okay, got it. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. So I guess if anybody has any sort of follow-up questions after the fact, they can reach out to you, Natasha, if that would be absolutely love all right. And uh, thanks for making a complicated protocol accessible in the hour. That was very, uh, very great. Good talk. Um, and thanks very much for talking to us today. Hopefully see you in person at some point. Okay. Good luck. Right, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye, everybody.